Welcome to a Neon Jazz interview with the New York-based jazz alto saxophonist and composer, Rudresh Mahanthapa. Born in Italy and raised in Boulder, Colorado with Indian roots, he has an impressive jazz sound and just released an ode to one of his favorite jazz cats, our very own Charlie Parker here in KC, on his latest album, Bird Calls. Rudresh is a refreshing, intelligent, and gifted musician that is one of the most in-demand players in the jazz world today, and he has big plans for the future. Dig this interview, my friends. First of all, thank you very much for taking a little time out for us here at Neon Jazz. We really appreciate it. Oh, sure, definitely. What I want to do is obviously talk about one of the most pressing things I'm sure going on with you right now, which is Bird Calls, and talk to me a little bit about the creative energy that went into this release. Well, you know, Charlie Parker is a huge influence on what I do and, and was my major inspiration to, you know, to make a life in jazz. So, oh yeah, a lot of my albums and a lot of my work in, in recent years has uh, heavily showcased and, and portrayed my uh, Indian heritage and um, has been an expression of my Indian American identity and, a lot of different forays to different degrees of, of seeing how non-Western and, and Western music can be unified into, uh, a, you know, a single statement of sorts and, uh, you know, avoiding real notions of, of cut and paste fusion and, and trying to create some music that uh, defies genre. But with Bird Calls, I, I really wanted to take a step back and, and look at my roots as a jazz musician and, you know, and all along, regardless of the music I've composed and, and recorded, you know, I consider myself a jazz musician first and foremost. And uh, it was just a really exciting endeavor to, to go back and, and re-examine Charlie Parker um, after all this time and, you know, all this other knowledge that, that I've amassed and, and all these other experiences and, and look at what made me want to play music when I was in really like you know sixth or seventh grade yeah absolutely and you have a very rich mosaic of geography in your life you were born in italy and then you grew up in uh colorado and then you made your way to new york went to depaul before that so kind of talk to me you have any formative memories of being in italy since you were born there no you know my father was on sabbatical so after I was born, I think he had, you know, three or four months left in the sabbatical. So we, uh, you know, I have no memories of Italy. I did finally make it back to, I was born in Trieste, and I, I did finally make it back there a few years ago, uh, which was great. You know, I found, I found the apartment where my parents lived and the hospital where I was born. But, you know, I don't feel a, a great, you know, strong tie to, to Italy, but it's uh but it's fun. It's a, it's, it's a fun idea. It's a fun little notion. And, and Trieste <laughs> is very unique, too, because it's, uh, you know, it's part of Italy, but at some po point was, you know, more part of what is now Slovenia, and it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So they have very mixed up food and mixed up art and mixed up architecture that's that's kind of Italian, but kind of Austro-Hungarian and um you know, there's definitely a hybrid sort of uh, system going on there, which yeah, I very well, much not, relate to, obviously. Well, no, that sounds like they're confused in the right way. Where is that geographically in Italy? It's practically on the border of Slovenia. It's like in the far northeast. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I have my family, half of my family came from Naples, and the other half came from Shaka, and I've been fortunate enough to get to the old country a couple times, and I would have to say to have a birth calling card from there would be a pretty cool notion, you know. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> so um, let me ask you this. What has been your re the, the reception to your jazz music in India? How do they think about jazz? Well, you know, I haven't played in India that often. So, you know, I, I mean, the last time I performed there was in 98. And since then, you know, albums that I've made, like Kinsman, which, you know, featured – um, the Karnatic superstar Kadri Gopalnath and, and I made an album called uh, Opti that features a trio of mine with tabla and guitar and, and those albums have you know made it somehow to India and I think there's um, there is some interest in, in what I do but you know these ideas of of uh, 
that idea of hybridity that you know that that comes through my music with you know this uh synthesis of indian ideas and and american ideas i mean i mean that's truly an american concept and so i think it's a little bit lost on um on indian music fans i mean i think they can appreciate the music for what it is and 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 hopefully enjoy it but i don't think they necessarily relate to um that that base of experience because you know i mean india is not a country of immigrants by by any means and right. so i think there's something unique to the western world to you know europe and um and and north america that that uh just the point of relation to that experience is, is different I mean, jazz in, in India is, is an interesting thing. I, I mean, I think there is space for, you know, this new generation of, you know, people my, like myself and Reza Bassi and Vijay Iyer. I mean, I, I think there is an audience there that we have not tapped into, but um, that doesn't necessarily care that what we're doing is jazz, but it's, it's, um, but it's music that they could relate to. As, as far as jazz goes, I mean, there is this, older crowd of you know a more cosmopolitan westernized crowd that uh that does does try to actually you know present concerts and you know these guys have these amazing record collections and you know they have everything that monk recorded and everything that coltrane recorded i mean and and they're incredibly well listened and and diligent supporters of the music so um but it's funny that you ask that because we are trying to go um, not with bird calls, but my previous project, Gamak, uh, we're trying to get to India this fall to to play some of those uh, newer jazz festivals that have started recently, and um, and hopefully do some other things that are just uh, maybe outside of the jazz vein, and where we can actually meet some people we otherwise wouldn't. Absolutely. So, talk to me a little bit about the influence of, of the Indian saxophonist Cosby on you, like as far as what kind of mentor and what kind of wisdom did he impart on you to approach jazz and life with the way that he did things? Well, hmm. I think uh the relationship with Cosby is very interesting. I mean he's you know, he's he's a really good friend and um and he has conducted himself as as an Indian musician much more like a jazz musician, which I I have great respect for, you know. He he brought this instrument that no one was playing in within any sort of Indian classical circles, the saxophone, because he just fell in love with the sound after having, you know, heard the saxophone in some of these British palace bands when he was young. And very much, you know, made sure that uh he did, you know, all his homework as as a classical Indian musician and that he could do anything on his instrument that any other musician could do, whether they're a vocalist or, you know, a violinist or, you know, one of these double reed players, like another swarm player. Um, and he also doesn't come from this, you know, there's this sense of lineage. There's this uh, importance placed on, on lineage in Indian music, that you studied with so-and-so or that you're the child of so-and-so and everyone in your family has played this instrument going seven generations back and, um, you know, and he doesn't have any of that, you know. So in that yeah. way, he has a sort of uh, renegade mentality that, you know, <laughs> that maybe someone like Charlie <laughs> Parker had, you know, that's hearing something in their head and, and is uh, going to do their damnedest to get it out into the world. Um, and then for me personally, uh, you know, I've been listening to a lot of Indian music, you know, if we go back to, say, the early 90s, you know, when I was in college, and I, I was dealing with it the same way I was dealing with jazz. I was trying to learn as much by ear as possible and try to play along with records the same way I was with, you know, Coltrane Records or, or whoever. And uh, But, uh, you know, the, the very difficult thing was, you know, with these vocalists and, and violinists and especially these string instruments, uh, you know, there's this complex system of, of ornamentation called gamaka in, in Indian music that uh, that is very difficult to convey on the saxophone for technical reasons. Um, you know, we can't slide around the way a string player or a vocalist can. And so I felt like I was missing a lot of the detail or I was kind of, you know, abbreviating some of the stuff because I didn't really know how to go about making it happen. Um, 
And so when I finally got my hands on one of Kadri's CDs, and at the time it was his only recording available um, outside of India, you know, and we're talking pre-internet, we're talking, you know, 1991, 1992 or something. Um, You know, the eye-opening thing was that I could actually hear how he was doing these things on the saxophone, and I could actually pick it apart technically uh, in addition to musically. Um, So that was, uh, you know, that was an eye-opening experience. And then, uh, you know, fast forward a few years later, he was was playing a concert in in, in the U.S. in Boston. I went backstage and talked to him, and he was just uh, blown away that there was an Indian-American... jazz musician, jazz alto saxophonist. I mean, he didn't know that, that one even existed. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and on top of that, you know, my parents and, you know, my ancestry, my parents and, and, and him are, you know, from a similar part of India. Um, and he also really liked my name. My name has kind of powerful meaning and um, in its Sanskrit roots. So, I, I gave him the CD that I uh, had on hand at the time, which I think was maybe Blackwater. What, it was either my first or second CD. And to this day, I don't know if he ever opened it and listened to it, <laughs> but I think he liked my energy and he liked my vibe, and we just kind of hit it off immediately. And, um, and, you know, and then a few years later, the, there were several opportunities that opened up for us to to collaborate. and. And that was great. I mean, for me, that was, you know, being in the room with him working on music is is probably as close as I will come to, you know, uh, having been able to be in the same room as as Bird or Coltrane. Right on. That's cool. So you grew up in Boulder, Colorado. Was there something about Boulder that really fostered a love and an appreciation for jazz? I think there's something about Boulder that, and I, I, you know, I haven't lived there in years, so I don't know if it's, it's still the case. But there's just something very open-minded and open-ended about Boulder. I mean, even the school system at the time, you know, if you if you showed interest in something, uh, the school would find a way for you know you to pursue that. You know, if if you were really good in math, they would connect you with a professor at the university, and, and you know you'd be able to miss school one afternoon to go work with a professor or something like that. So it was this is a very encouraging environment. Period, and that was before all of the, you know the budget cuts that have happened over the last twenty years. And we had a great band program from from instrumental music from fourth grade all the way through high school was was incredibly strong. I mean, my high school had. Two jazz bands, one orchestra, one concert band, one marching band, and 12 choirs. Wow. I mean, it was, you know, we had a a lot of music. I mean, music was like one whole wing of the school. And the facilities were amazing, too. And, you know, and I showed some some gumption to want to try to write music and lead a band. And so I, you know, started a little trio or a quartet. And and the school very much got behind that and, and gave us time to work on that and you know, sent us to festivals and competitions and um but, you know, on top of that I had a I had an amazing teacher from the very beginning all the way until I went to college. So um and he's a very good uh um well respected musician in the in the Denver Metro community. His name is Mark Harris. And Mark just uh I think I was probably his first student or one of his first students ever. I think he was a sophomore or a junior at, at, at University of Colorado and I was in fourth grade and he uh you the one of the major things he you know imparted in me was just a sense of individuality and, and unique personality and and you know being yourself and and following your gut and you know, learning as much as you possibly can, but always trying to uh, maintain a unique voice. And we didn't label a lot of music either. I mean, he would come over for my lessons. That was when a teacher used to come to your house. I don't know if those days still exist, but he came over and, um, you know, he would always bring three or four LPs with him. And they'd always be different. And he'd loan them to me for the week. And, you know, it might be Stravinsky and Gentle Giant and Sidney Bechet and Duke Ellington. And, cool. you know, and I would listen to these things over the course of the week, and I was listening to these things all at the same time. So I didn't really, 
I didn't draw like incredible boundaries of, you know, of genre and style. I mean, all these things ex- existed in the same continuum for me. So, you know, and then maybe on the jazz end of things, you know, I didn't really think ab- about Bird and, and Ornette and Louis Armstrong and, um, you know, Sidney Bechet being different from each other. I just, they all existed. They all inhabited the same space for me. So it really wasn't until I went to college where people were talking about hard bop. I mean, obviously bebop, of course, but people were talking about hard bop and avant-garde and this guy plays outside and this guy plays inside. And it's like, what is, you know, what is this? You know, Ornette yeah. sounds like bird to me and, you know, and, um, you know, uh, Berlioz sounds like Sonny Stitt. Like these are, <laughs> all these things are, in the in happening the same part of of my world so um so that was probably the greatest thing that that uh you know the greatest gift that he gave me and he very much lived that as well uh every time i went to see him play he was playing with a different sort of group one day it would be an afro pop band another day it might be a big band um another day um it might be a duo with drums, and then another day it was like a progressive rock band. And so he had this very diverse palette himself. And so having a role model like that from such a young age was, uh, you know, really made all the difference. And I try to do the same thing when I'm teaching as well. Right on. So you got degrees from the Berkeley College of Music in DePaul. What did you learn about jazz in those institutions getting those degrees? Well... I mean, it was different. I mean, I, I think a lot of school, I mean, I think 50% of school or, or even less, is, you know, is the coursework. It's more about finding the right teachers that happen to be at these schools and, and being in a creative environment, hopefully with some like-minded students. So the two things that were important to me to do at Berkeley, you know, the reasons I went there, one was to study with Joe Viola. Uh, Joe Viola was a legendary saxophone teacher, not necessarily a jazz teacher, but um, just a saxophone teacher, just the mechanics of, of playing the instrument. And um, it was really kind of the last of its kind, you know, the, the kind of a direct uh, descendant of the French conservatory school, which is, you know, kind of the, the preeminent, preeminent school as to how to play the saxophone. Yeah. So that was important to me. And then, uh, and George Garzone was teaching there as well. And, and George was someone, you know, I really liked his playing. I liked his spirit. I liked his, you know, he was definitely had a unique sound, but was, you know, kind of simultaneously based in Stan Getz and Coltrane. And again, one of these guys who has checked out a lot of things and, and, and created his own space. Um, so those were my two biggest directives going to Berkeley. And then along the way, I think, you know, the really important thing was, was meeting some like-minded students and, and working on, on ideas and concepts together and, you know, and really, you know, playing, you know, playing, you know, putting together jam sessions and playing till, you know, two or three in the morning every night. You know, that was much more important uh, than the coursework. And there were a couple of other teachers there that were, that were really impactful, but, it's more about finding this environment than finding a school that's going to spoon feed you what jazz is supposed to be or Absolutely. what jazz is, you know. it's like, um, And in that sense, you don't necessarily need to go to school. I mean, I think the degrees are fine if, if you'd like to pursue, you know, academia at, at, at some point. But um, I think you can achieve some of those things just by – you know, moving to a creative environment. I mean, there are plenty of people, at least not so much anymore, but back in the day there were people that just, you know, they moved to New York to play music and uh, and, and New York was school. Um, DePaul was an interesting situation. Uh, You know, a lot of my classmates at Berkeley were were moving to New York and it was almost like there was this prescribed template that, you know, you go to Berkeley and then you move to New York and and you don't really question that. (laughs) You don't think about, well, (laughs) does that really sound like a good idea? You know, am I going to be able to eat and pay my rent, you know, or, and I just, I really didn't really like New York. I had visited a few times. I, I thought it was very overwhelming. Um, and I had a couple of friends in Chicago that said, well, you know, the scene is very healthy here and, you know, why don't you come check it out? And, and one of them was a, was a student at DePaul. So he, uh, so I went out there and stayed with him. Um, and not only did I check out the school, but I really, you know, checked out the scene. I went to every jam session. I went to every club and, you know, just kind of 
scoped out what the possibilities were like there. And and then there was this very bizarre coincidence where one one of my ensemble directors at Berkeley, um, the, his best man at his wedding was the director of the jazz studies program at DePaul. So he, wow. he made a couple of phone calls for me, and so <laughs> that transition was was very easy. And uh, and when I was there, I wasn't really interested in in performance, a performance degree. Uh, I mean, I, I you know I'd already studied with Joe and, and George, and um, I was more interested in composition and arranging. And, and there was a really great teacher there named Paul McKee who. And again, it was very open-ended, which was the best way for for me to learn, and has always been the best way for me to learn. Like, uh, so he kind of let me do whatever I wanted. I said, "Well, I'm going to try to write, you know, a big band chart." And he said, "Okay, well, go work on it. Come back, and then we'll talk about it." And, um, and actually, a lot of the music I wrote uh, during that degree ended up being the music for, um, you know, for my first album. So. That was a really beneficial place, and then I stayed in Chicago for a couple of years after, and just and just worked and played. You know, I was teaching at a couple of universities and um, and playing as many gigs as I could, and and writing more music. And um, but to do what I really wanted to do, I knew that uh, I knew that I had to move to New York. It actually boiled down to one very easy question. I said, uh, I said, well, I would like to play with Jack DeJohnette and Dave Holland someday. And is that ever going to happen if I stay in Chicago? And I think the answer was clearly no. <laughs> so yeah. That, you know, so I left and, um, you know, and just kind of moved on. So you make it to the Mecca, you make it to New York, and you hook up with VJIO. That had to be one hell of a jazz baptismal right there. Well, actually, I mean, that's interesting. VJ and I met, um, had already been doing stuff before I moved to New York. Uh, people okay. often think, that um that that happened in New York but that actually happened earlier but that happened uh maybe in 95 like a couple of years before because at that time Steve Coleman the great alto saxophonist who has also been a, a very big influence uh on me he um he didn't really do that much teaching he's doing a lot of teaching kind of seminar workshop oriented uh things now but at that time he wasn't really doing much of that and but there was this rare instance that he was teaching at the stanford jazz workshop in california so i got wind of that and wow this you know kind of a unique opportunity to ideally hopefully hang out with steve for a week and pick his brain and so i went out there that summer and um Vijay had just recorded his very first album, and Steve had played on a few tracks. And uh, and additionally, Steve had had a had led a larger group called the Mystic Rhythm Society that had I think had two piano players in it, and, and one of them was one of them was Vijay. Steve had had really tapped into the Bay Area music scene. He spent a month out there with the Five Elements, with this idea of of meeting a bunch of local musicians in the Bay Area and. and and, and collaborating with them. So that's how that's how he and Vijay met. So so Steve was actually the one who introduced us. Um I remember at the beginning of the workshop Steve kept talking about somebody named VJ who played piano and and I was thinking it was someone's initials that were VJ. And then finally I was like I was like, Is this guy Indian? He said, Yeah. I said, Is his name Vijay? He said, Yeah, yeah, that's how you say it. <laughs> and uh so and I was very flattered when Steve introduced us. Uh, you know, Steve was like, "Yeah, Vijay, I'd love to play on your gigs. You know, you have this new album out, but you know, if I can't make it, you should call this guy." And uh, so that's how that started. So cool. you know, Vijay and I hung out. We didn't really do much playing, but we hung out one night, stayed up pretty late, and kind of talked about life and our backgrounds, and realized that we had so many things in common that had nothing to do with music, but. But on top of that, not only were we pursuing improvised music, but we were pursuing it along similar lines with similar interests. And we obviously both of us really liked Steve Coleman, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we kept in touch over the course of the year. And my first album came out. And his first album came out. And he managed to get a gig for us at this um, Asian South Asian Arts and Activism Festival in Toronto. He got us a duo gig. And... uh 
you know, we still hadn't played together. So we sent each other a bunch of music and we got there three days ahead of time and, and rehearsed like crazy. And, and we've been playing together ever since. I think we're, I can't remember if it's going to be 19 years or 20 years this year. Wow. Right on. So in all of the albums, 12 plus that you've released, do you think Bird Calls is one of your most important pieces of work? <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I think we always think the last thing we did is, the, is one of our most important pieces of work. But I think, um, yes, I will, I will say yes. Uh, I think, I mean, for me, it, it, it's nice to uh it's nice for me to show people that I'm a jazz musician and um I don't think anyone has lost sight of that necessarily but you know so much of what I've done you know since say you know 2008 or something has been very much oriented towards you know my perspectives on you know what what global culture is and what global music can be and and all of that is so much you know woven into the fabric of what I do I mean I think it comes out regardless of what I do whether I'm uh deliberately or or not uh so to check back in with Charlie Parker is is definitely very important to me and I think it's uh you know it also shines a light on you know this important historical figure that who who remains very relevant now and and showing that his 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 relevancy is and his impact is timeless i think it's it's very important and um and shows a strong sense of you know the historical nature of this music and and that you know everyone has to really thank charlie parker uh, if anyone who's playing music today at some point has to thank Charlie Parker because he really did make many things possible. Absolutely. So let me ask you this. If you could get into that Star Trek chamber and go back in time and meet anybody in the world of jazz, who would it be and what would you want to talk to them about? I think, well, I mean, I think, I, I think, you know, Charlie Parker would definitely be up there. I mean, I would also like to meet Coltrane. Um, I remember reading this quote that uh, that I really liked. It was on the back of one of the first Bird albums I ever had. And, and I didn't really understand it at the time. And it, it just struck me again, I, I think. I think Charlie Parker met uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh -huh. And... And he told him, he said, I like the way you play very much. And I just I just thought that was really, really cool. And uh kind of speaks to what uh you know, artistic expression can be or you know, or what it is, you know, how you know, this this idea of medium and genre, maybe, you know, these are these are lines that, you know, we've drawn maybe too heavily in the sand here. Uh yeah. So I almost feel like I would love to meet Charlie Parker, but I don't, I'm not sure I would necessarily want to talk to him about music. You know, I would, I think yeah. I would like to talk to him about life and food and art or, you know, if I could bring J Charlie Parker into the present, I would, you know, love to take him to the Museum of Modern Art in New York and just look at art together. That'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be very cool. Yeah, that's great. So let me ask you this. What's the greatest thing about waking up every day? The greatest thing about waking up every day is seeing my son. Cool. Yeah, we we have a, a two year old. Uh, he was born in December 2012, and he is he is just a joy. You know, I'm talking while well, I'm talking to you right now. I'm on the road. I'm in Cleveland, and um, you know, I definitely miss him, especially when I <laughs> first thing when I wake up because yeah. he is just uh, so much fun and and such an inspiration, and I feel like I'm just relearning and, and re-examining so many things about life through his eyes and, and his perspective. That's beautiful. Very cool. So you're one of the favorites in Downbeat. You're one of the favorites in the modern jazz realm at this point. Tell me what, you know, it's not the goal I know of any musician to get hardware and awards, but is there one award that you got that you're like, man, that's cool? Uh, yeah, I think there are a couple. Well, it's funny, I, you know, I think I had to preface this. So, you know, I remember that, you know, there was a time, 
you know, we're, maybe jazz had a different place in the industry. But I remember seeing those critics' polls and readers' polls when I was in high school and college. And and at kind of simultaneously, I very much wanted to be on those. And, and at, you know, at the same time, could, couldn't even imagine being on, on those. You know? <laughs> and, and the first time I ever made it onto... And, and, and this is just kind of a, a weird story, but I think it, it, it shows some reality of the situation. But the first time I ever just made it on to the downbeat readers poll, um, you know, like pretty far down there, maybe number seven or number 11 or something like that. I remember I was so broke, I had to borrow $5 from my girlfriend to go buy the copy at that part of the mobile. So you know, that kind of puts put some of it in perspective. And yeah. I think there was a time that, what, you know, when if you were topping these polls, they actually, that actually led to gigs, that led to work. That was like a real form of promotion. And, I, you know, it may remain that to some degree, but it's nothing like it was, say, in the 80s or maybe even in the 90s. So, But the recognition is great, and those guys at Downbeat are great. I'm, I'm so honored to, you know, for all these people to be fans of what I do and, and see it as being important. I think getting the Guggenheim Fellowship was a really big one for me um, because it was uh, really in the realm of being a composer and um, not necessarily in the context of jazz, but, but speaking to music composition in general. And, you know, the people who have received the Guggenheim for music composition are they're some of the <laughs> some of the greatest composers that have ever lived. So, Absolutely. You know, to it, to inhabit that world uh, for a little while is um, is really an honor, I think. Um, and of course, you know, there was this Doris Duke Performing Arts Award that I that I got a couple of years ago. That um, it was a spe- specifically for jazz. I mean, Doris Duke was a huge jazz fan, and has, and the, that foundation has been a really ardent supporter of of jazz in general in in the U.S. and and that was a really amazing award too, and and really something that was um, not, not only life-changing with regard to the recognition, but, but the actual, you know, the size of the award was actually life-changing too and, you know, has allowed us to, uh, you know, better our, our, home, uh, our home situation as well. So that was really great also. Right on. So is, is the home that uh, brought Charlie Parker the world here in Kansas City, do you have any plans of bringing the uh, bird talks here and, and playing it? I would I would love to. I, we have not pursued that, um, but I, I would love to pursue that. I think, uh, you know, if I remember correctly, does the, does the Jazz Museum, the Jazz Museum is there, correct? Yeah, the American Jazz Museum is there, yes. Yeah, and uh, I was talking with them a number of years ago about doing something there. I don't know how much how much uh, they're presenting in the way of concerts, but I think I need to, uh, you know, revisit that conversation and see if we could get there. I, I think it would be a real shame if this project did not did not get to Kansas City. Yeah, that'd be beautiful. We would love. We'd have open arms. Um, let me get kind of an idea of 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 who you are a little bit. Tell me what what's the last vinyl you spun. Um, vinyl album. Oh gosh, the last vinyl album I spun was probably Dire Straits' "Brothers in Arms." Nice, very nice, <laughs> uh, very nice. And let me ask you this: Let's say in ten years we talk and we catch up with what's going on. What are you going to be happy to tell me happened? What are you really wanting to see happen? Maybe in the next decade, as your career goes forward. Oh, that's interesting. Um, hopefully, I'll be happy to tell you that uh, that I have uh, a, an, an academic position that um, is allowing me to, you know, pass what I know on to some other people in, in, in a more sort of formal structure. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully I'll have at least another five albums out <laughs> and... Cool. Um, and we'll be pursuing more that's than just the outside of jazz. You know, I'm I, here. I'm in Cleveland because I, I wrote a big piece for a dance company, and we are um, and the band plays live with them, and it's it's a, a really great collaboration. I'm looking forward to doing more things that are interdisciplinary like that. Um, yeah, 
And maybe I'll be telling you about a Grammy. Who knows? Right on. That's cool, man. What What do you think there? If someone reads your bio, you know, people that that, that read up on you and and look into your music after they hear you, what 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 piece about you does the world not know about that you think would be safe to tell me right now that people just don't know about you? Hmm. Uh, that I watch a lot of TV. <laughs> cool. Very cool. And then final question, if you had to sum up who you are in the length of a tweet, our 21st century friend, how would you sum yourself up? Saxophonist, citizen of the world, loving father, devoted husband. Right on. That's a great way to end right there. Hey, Rudrish, I really appreciate your time. I love your music. I'm going to spin it healthily on my show. Oh, thank you. It's great to talk to you, too. Thanks for listening and tuning in to get another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York City, Kansas City, spots all over America, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Rudrish for his time and insights. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit theneonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.